The Tom Woods Show, episode 2076. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey folks, a lot of your friends believe that deregulation caused the financial crisis of 2008 just as fervently as they believe that lockdowns are the solution to COVID-19. For the sake of our future, both of these ideas need to be smashed. So check out my free ebook, The Deregulation Boogeyman, over at regulationmyths.com. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here, joined today by our old friend Pete Canonis. And you may remember him from such podcasts as I can't I can't help introducing you as Troy McClure, but you may remember him from such podcasts as Free Man Beyond the Wall. But oh no, no, it is now the Pete Canonas show. And we're going to talk to him about, let's say, you know, rethinking things and thinking about what's likely to work in the 21st century, what's likely to appeal to people, which people are likely to find us appealing, these kinds of questions. Pete also produced The Monopoly on Violence, that outstanding documentary we also talked to him about. So Pete, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me back, Tom. All right. There's a lot we can talk about, a lot of fun, interesting topics, but I would be scared to rebrand my podcast. Everybody knows it as the Tom Woods show. So if it suddenly became something else, I feel like I'd have to run around and correct everybody. And I like, I don't even know if technically does it mean people have to resubscribe or does it automatically appear in the feed of your podcast? Like, I don't even know how that works. It did. Yeah. It, it just moved down. It, like, if you go into a podcast app and it's alphabetical, obviously it's going to move down now. But, um, you know, I'm no stranger to changing names. So, you know, I didn't think anybody would be too upset by it. It just got to the point where I noticed that I would listen to people's podcasts and they would say, Pete said this and Pete said that. And I'm like, sounds like I have a brand. And I wanted to start reaching out to people outside of our sphere and putting my name on it instead of free man beyond the wall, which then you might have to explain to some people and yada, yada. I thought that would make it a lot easier. And yeah, really just getting my name out there and um, changing branding a little bit. All right. Well, part of this is a somewhat personal story. And part of it has to do with ideas and ideology where we get into all those fun sorts of things. Because I think you and I are coming from, you know, if we don't have exactly the same ideas, the thrust is is very similar. But recall for everybody from the first time you were on the program, uh, how you came about all these ideas. It was not that you were at, you know, the University of Arizona sitting in the library and you happened to stumble upon a Rothbard book. I mean, what was it for you? And the same story a lot of people have. 2007, watching a debate the GOP debate. and um, Wait, you were a Ron Paul guy? I was a Ron Paul. How did I not remember that? Jeez, my memory is so bad. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, and um, I had been struggling for, you know, six, seven years on foreign policy. I knew when they started the whole WMDs in Iraq thing, just from talking to people that I had known at the time who were like more like hardcore lefties, they're like, this is all a lie and everything like that. And it really wasn't that political and so I had a bunch of questions. And then when, you know, Ron said they hate us because we're over there, we've been bombing them forever, it just sort of clicked. And then it just sent me down the rabbit hole. And actually, yeah, the first thing I, I bought Ron's foreign policy book, which I believe is just speeches from the House floor. And then yeah. I got into economics because obviously the next year, what happens? We have the the meltdown. And well, I found a book called Meltdown, and I read it twice. And I'm like, oh, so this is exactly what happened. For right. new listeners, let's clarify that this book, Meltdown, was written by somebody they've heard of. Yeah, that would be the, Tom Woods. And it's actually here. signed. Yeah, I actually got it signed at a Campaign for Liberty event in 2000, January 2011 in Atlanta. Holy cow, I met you that long ago? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I wasn't Mance Raider or Pete Raymond or Pete Quinones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that is, okay. All right, so that's really interesting. So where were you coming from? Were you just not interested in politics or were you a lefty or a neocon or what? Well, I mean, I grew up in in New York City and, you know, my grandparents, just Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, John F. Kennedy. But, yeah, I grew up in the Reagan era and my dad really liked Reagan. So, yeah, you know, I was a teenage kind of Reaganite, but you know, not hardcore. 
I wasn't studying everything. You know, I didn't know about the gun bill that he passed in 86 or a lot of things. I just, you know, knew that I liked him, that he seemed like a, like a statesman, which, you know, when you're 16, 17 years old, what, what does that mean? He just seemed like the kind of guy I would want to be as president. And um, so I always came from the right when it came to like politics, but I grew up in a completely left kind of cultural environment. So I guess that can take us into other other directions too. <laughs> All right. So you hear Ron Paul, the foreign policy stuff resonates with you. And then you did you did the meme books that mm-hmm. we talked about. That was 2017. Uh, so that was a big yeah, jump. So, That's 10 years later, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So during that 10 years, you're just like a normal human being who happens to be sympathetic to these ideas, or what are you up to? Yeah, I'm, I'm reading Rothbard, um, reading Mises. I'm also studying world religions. I looked at Islam. There was a Buddhist temple in Atlanta that I went to for a little while just to find out what they were all about. I learned to meditate in the late 2000s, and so I knew that they were you know, meditation was a big part of them. So, I mean, but it wasn't for me. I still meditate every day though. But, you know, so that's basically what I was doing was I think I was really just trying to find myself, trying to find my center. And I knew from the 2007, 2008, from the wars and everything. And after you, you know, see the picture that libertarianism paints of the wars, you realize the kind of world that you live in. And I was just really trying to find my center. And um, I think I did. I think if it wasn't for those 10 years, if I would have just, you know, jumped in and started to try to be a content creator in 2008 or 2009, I think I'd have been pretty awful at it. I think I needed to really find a center for myself. And um, I like order a lot. And recently my life has been a little bit in disorder, but now it's back in order. And I think it's the only way that I can actually produce content that I'm happy with. And I think I'm really happy with what I'm doing right now. Well, I think there's a lot to be said for waiting until you really steep yourself in it and you read and you reflect. I love youthful energy. Don't get me wrong. I'm thrilled that we have college students and young people who are interested in this stuff. But to be a, let's say, I don't know, a podcast host, let's say, I mean, somebody who's going to take on a lot of different issues on a regular basis, I think you really need a good, solid grounding. You know, you, you can't just be, I read five articles and I'm convinced. You know, you've got to have that grounding. And I see in the conservative movement, a lot of times, I'll just see some airhead spouting off about something that that person just knows nothing about, but they feel like, well, I know the three official slogans of the conservative movement. Isn't that enough for me? Not really. <laughs> you know, so I think this is the correct approach. So you had the uh, free man beyond the wall and you did work that generated an audience for you. And I think you, by the way, are an example of, I'm not saying this to flatter you, I have no reason to, but of what, frankly, sheer hard work can accomplish. There are a lot of libertarian podcasts these days, way more than when I started this one almost nine years ago. And so you think, how can I stand out in that crowd? Well, the answer is, do what Pete did. If you really, really insist on crowding an already crowded, uh, you know, further crowding an already crowded podcast world, You just kept on pumping out the content just again and again and again, and you promoted it skillfully. You figured out ways to get the word out about it. You had interesting guests. You engaged them very effectively. And the result is that you may not be the most famous person in the movement, but way more people know who you are than I bet you thought might when you've started all this. I mean, you're probably in the top tier all of a sudden. And that was just through sheer hard work. Nobody handed you anything. Well, honestly, writing those two books like right on top of each other, and I mean, those books are embarrassing to me right now. They consist of no nuance whatsoever. I would love to, if I rewrote them now, they'd probably be three times as long. But you, Dave, Mark Claire, having me on to promote those and to you know talk about the podcast and let people hear hear my voice, that helped a great deal, you know. And I'm I've told you before that I'm. I'll never be able to repay you. And another thing is the first time that we hung out at the Mises Institute, you know, you talked to me about monetizing and everything, and you convinced me to monetize. And that was incredibly helpful and has gotten me to the point now where, 
you know, I don't have a full-time job and I can just concentrate on putting out three, four episodes a week and, you know, writing for my sub stack uh, three times a week. So thank you. Well, my pleasure. I, I love the idea of Substack. I'm shocked at how quickly the thing has taken off. The first time I saw it, I just thought it was some oddball platform. And then I started seeing it absolutely everywhere, I guess because it more or less is understood as a censorship-free way to put out a newsletter. And it's in a way, it reminds me of Patreon, which is, of course, not censorship-free, but in the sense that by the time Patreon got started, I already had supportinglisteners.com. And by the time Substack got started, I already had my Tom Woods newsletter that you know I put up at tomwoods.com that people can sign up for that way. But if I were to do it over again, I probably would hop on Substack. I, I like the functionality of it. I like the way it allows you to monetize it while still sharing some material for free. I think it works great. You can also host a podcast on it. Oh, no, that I didn't know. Yeah. I use Libsyn, which is probably the most popular podcast host in the world. I could move over to Substack and basically start hosting from there. Ah, okay. All right. So it's really, really an indispensable platform for a lot of independent voices. Yeah. I mean, almost, I wouldn't say everybody I know, but a lot of the people with really unique perspectives, if I Google and see if they have a Substack, they almost inevitably do. So on the other hand, the other side of that is means there's a lot of competition out there. And that's a tricky thing, is even before we get into the philosophical questions, you know, you're somebody who's an independent content creator who does this full time. And so you have a lot of amazing tools like Substack, but so does everybody else. And so you got to really hustle day in and day out to keep your audience, maybe try to build it. You know, I'm not doing as good of a job on that as I should. I don't spend enough time. I'm, I'm happy with my existing audience. I should be spending more time on audience building, but I've been established for so long that I don't have to have a lot of anxiety about that, that I'll wake up and I have zero listeners all of a sudden. I should work on it more. But how, as somebody who, let's say, you've been doing this, uh, how many years podcasting? I started the podcast in July 2017. Okay, July. Okay, so you're coming upon five years. What does your typical day look like then in terms of uh, you spend some time writing, you spend some time doing a uh, podcast episode, and then... You spend some time on promotion. Is that how it works? Yeah. So I like to do my writing for my Substack, which is, um, I think the tagline of my Substack is where all of my rhetoric goes, where, where I'm, just, I'm just going to rant. And that's what I pretty much do with my Substack. So I really like to do that in the morning with coffee and then start promoting, get on social media, start putting out that there's a new episode out, there's a new Substack out. Then anything that I have scheduled to record for the podcast, I'll just figure out what somebody's schedule is. You know how it is. Some people can record during the day. Some people can only record in the evening. So I just plan it out that way. And really in between, I'm just at this point, especially um, being single and you know basically living by myself with my two cats, I'm just doing this. And I mean... You know, of course, I'm running to the grocery store, I'm doing laundry, stuff like that. But really, at this point, it's just to promote what I'm doing and promote the message that I'm putting out there. Yeah, so I'm always happy and grateful for the people who turn over their hard-earned money, especially as this, you know, the monetary situation we're going through, and give it to me so that I can keep doing this. And um, yeah, I mean, it's really... I've used this phrase a lot. It's really humbling. All right, let's talk about the key question here. You've had a bit of a shift in orientation, let's say in terms of what kinds of people you feel like are most likely to find what we have to offer appealing and in terms of how you would present what we have to offer to them. So let's start right there. In what direction has your thinking moved and what has pushed it that way? So the name of the podcast now is The Pete Quinones Show. And the subtitle to it is Getting Liberty Right. Anyone who's familiar with Hans Hermann Hoppe and books that the Mises Institute put out might know where I got that title from. There's a book of four of his speeches from, from a Property Freedom Society over the past decade that 
the Mises Institute transcribed and put it into a book called Getting Libertarianism Right. And the right is not to be defined as correct. The right is to be defined as to the right. And it all comes down to four things and even five things now. The first thing was COVID. Even before COVID, I was starting to question practicality of how do we get the message out there and how do we even implement it, praxis. And COVID just basically changed my thinking in a lot of ways. I just, I started asking questions that probably weren't fair. Like, you know, how come libertarianism has been around for 70 years, the the philosophy of it, you know, you can go over 100 years for Austrian economics. How come we haven't been able to influence the culture at all to the point where people will allow things to be shut down for, I mean, we're seeing the effects of it 24 months later. and and we're going to see it into the future. And then this was bad enough, but what I've termed the summer of love, 2020, when Americans were murdered in the streets and people don't want to talk about that, that just basically told me that, okay, COVID championed by the left and the regime. The summer of love, quote unquote, championed by the left and the regime. I think I can see who the enemy is now. And that enemy needs to be stopped. So how do we stop it? And one of the things that I did was, first I started talking about agorism, which I think is invaluable, invaluable in the world today. But I don't think it's a way to take down a state. I don't think it's going to take down a state. And then I started reading Hoppe, who I had read a bunch of, but I hadn't really gotten deep into. And Hoppe started started reading about his local strategy, especially from what must be done. And I started to realize, I looked and I saw, especially the part where he said, in your local town, anyone who is living on the dole, government work or anything, they shouldn't have a vote. They shouldn't have a vote in anything. And I was like, I'm starting to see why a lot of libertarians don't like Hoppe because I probably wouldn't have liked that before 2020. But I was like, oh, he's making sense. These people are literally seeking to destroy us. And he's saying, well, no, you, have, you need to take their power away. You know? And then you hear people like Michael Malice say, well, just seize the university's endowments. And I'm like, well, that's not very libertarian at all. But why do I agree with that? Because it's the way to defeat the left, to basically take their power away, is take their money away. And I just looked at a lot of libertarians who were like, that's a bridge too far. And, you know, I started studying liberalism too, the history of liberalism. I went back to the Enlightenment and I'm like, has liberalism brought us to where this is? You know, the idea of the marketplace of ideas comes directly out of the Enlightenment. Is that what brought us here? That well, I mean, cultural Marxism and Keynesianism, if that's the marketplace of ideas, maybe liberalism has failed completely. And I understood that the left needed to be fought. So at the end of 2020 and the beginning of 2021, I'm like, well, I'm a libertarian and the libertarian party, they're talking about this takeover and there's a whole bunch of lefties in there. Well, let me fight against these people. And then I'm like, wait a minute, but they have no power. The only thing they have power over is libertarianism and possibly the, the word term libertarian. But I don't care about that. I care about lockdowns. I care about you know, people being murdered in the street. I care about whether an election was real or not. And then January 6th happens and I'm worried about whether American citizens are going to be thrown into dungeons for taking a tour of the Capitol building. And I'm like, well, I don't know that the libertarian party or even libertarianism at large has a an answer to this a praxis something that we can actually do so you know a couple of us started talking and i came up with this term post libertarian that was like on a whim just to throw it into a a title of an episode and i was trying to remember if i read it on curtis yarvin's blog from like 2007 or if and then i 
I asked him, he said, no, I've never written that. And then my friend Charles, he had actually used it as an episode title like a year and a half ago. So it must have stuck with me. And then I put that in there and that just made people, a bunch of people go nuts. And they're just like post-libertarianism. And obviously, you know, post, um, post-modernism, they, the link to it and everything. What do you mean by post-libertarian and everything? And my friend LB came up with this and he said, post-libertarian isn't like what you are. It's a moment that occurs when in the face of lockdowns, a libertarian sees dogmatic professions of faith and popular democratic political strategies as insufficient methods of stopping government and corporate tyranny. And that's when things started changing for me where I was just like, well, we need to come up with a strategy for for beating this back. And you know, I decided that I thought along with Hoppe, and I agree with Hoppe, really the only way to do that would be through one of the two major parties. And since the left is absolutely insane at this point, and the GOPs, I consider them to just be weak at this point, but at least people look at the GOP as a legitimate option. All right, let's unpack a bit of this stuff here. <laughs> First of all, you were saying that lockdowns occurred and you were talking about libertarianism and that libertarianism had not penetrated the American psyche to the point where we could get a substantial number of people saying, hey, don't shut down society. But it's even worse than that. It's that there were libertarians who were, or people who call themselves libertarians, who were completely at best missing in action during all this. Mm. Yeah, no wonder we haven't had any success. These people, when push comes to shove, are completely silent, not a word. Because in their heart of hearts, I am quite certain they agreed with these policies. I mean, yes, yes, yes. If you absolutely pin them down, they would say, yeah, it probably should be voluntary. But even that, their heart's not really in it. You know, they'll come up with some reason that actually the non-aggression principle applies to viruses, which is why you need to stay in your house. Whatever it is, they were there just blowing it completely. And then we observed in Canada what happened with the truckers in the Emergencies Act and the police and all this stuff. But what happened to them in the realm of money and banking was particularly alarming. And of course, also to people who donated to them. Now they have to live in terror. And what's going on there, that had nothing to do with health. That is the Canadian regime punishing perceived enemies. Meanwhile, what do we get from fashionable libertarian opinion in the United States about this? Zero, nothing. Why? Because culturally, they hate these truckers. These truckers mm -hmm. are everything they can't stand. These truckers have old-fashioned, unsophisticated views that they don't express in the, at the Cato Institute, you know, over there at their cocktail party or whatever. And so they are loathed and despised. They're not one of these allegedly marginalized groups who are held up by the media, who this brand of libertarianism wants to champion. These are the truly marginalized groups. These are the despised who are just as despised by the elites, so-called, of libertarianism. So, of course, they're not fighting against what's happening in Canada or even talking about it because they can't stand the – they hate the guts of these people. And you come to the conclusion that, um, yeah, I guess I agree with these people that, you know, price controls lead to shortages and some stupid fundamentals that don't really matter these days – but when push comes to shove, I have way more in common with that trucker than I do with that guy writing his policy paper at the think tank. Absolutely. That's one thing that I really had to examine is we talk about culture all the time. And culture is, I mean, culture is everything in the United States. People in the United States love their culture, especially people on the right. But people on the left love their culture too. You know, and there's different cultures within both of those. But you know, the right seemed to be way more sane on the lockdowns. They were right on the riots. I think that a good portion of the United States at this point is, especially on the right, questions whether elections are real, especially after like the Time magazine article by Mar Molly Ball back in January, where they're like, yeah, well, we fortified the election to make sure that it was going to be fair. Okay, that sounds good. And then, of course, January 6th. But yeah, I mean, and here's the thing is, all those things you said about libertarians is right. It's true. They, especially the ones in D.C. that want to keep getting invited to the parties and not be seen as radicals, you know, like Tom Woods and Lou Rockwell and those crazy guys. And 
I've just gotten to the point where I don't want to fight with them anymore. Because in the long run, they have no power. The only power they really have is to destroy the term libertarian. And I don't really care about that term anymore. I mean, it's, to me, libertarian is, it's an ideology, but it's, to me, it's basically property rights and the right of free association, who you want to associate with. And that's what I'm trying to do with the show is I'm trying to not only bring people in from the right and teach them more about libertarian ideas, about property rights, about freedom of association, so that hopefully that can help them talk about national divorce or whatever they want to talk about, taking, you know, taking over their town government, but also to try to pull some libertarians to the right as well, which I think I'm, from the feedback I'm getting, I'm doing pretty well. I mean, I am getting a lot of, you know, when I do episodes on James Burnham or Sam Francis, some people think that that's just a bridge too far and that's fine. But I see the left as the enemy, the left and the regime, which I think are one and the same. I see them as the enemy of humanity right now. I mean, are we ever going to know how many people died because of loneliness in the last couple of years, of broken hearts? How many people you know, couldn't hold the hand of a loved one while they were dying? I, I mean, I want to destroy these people. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. This is no longer the debating society that it used to be. I keep saying this, but look, I grew up in the 80s, and I remember that this level of nastiness and half the country wishing the other half would die simply didn't exist. We had arguments, and we sure didn't like each other's candidates, but it was not like this. I respected Tip O'Neill. I mean, Tip O'Neill, he would run off at the mouth and everything like that. And I was just like, God, I mean, I don't agree with this guy at all when I was, you know, being a Reaganite kid and everything. But I respected him. I didn't think he wanted me dead. Yeah, it's a crazy situation. But here's the concern I have, though. I mean, I agree with you. I think, and I know there are people listening who say, oh, there's no such thing as left and right. Yes, there is. You're wrong. Sorry, you're wrong. Yes, there is. And it must just be that your definitions are wrong or something because there is a left and a right. And I've done episodes on that, talking about what the differences between them are. And no, not every person is an absolutely perfect specimen of either one. But you can approximate what these ideas mean. And even if you don't know the history of these ideas, you know it when you see it. I mean, let's be honest. We, we, know, we know it when we see it. And yeah, I do feel like there is one particular one of those that is taking aim at me. And I'm not saying that it's inconceivable that the right could be bad. Certain parts of the right are bad, and even the good, the good parts have their blind spots, and that's why I want to make them libertarian so that they'll correct those blind spots. But I could take that to the extreme of saying, look, the left is out to get us, and therefore all these libertarian concerns about abstract principles have to go by the wayside. And so we have to be willing to be really tough with these people and, yeah, and censor them and do various other things in order to defeat them. And if you disagree with that, then you're a pie-in-the-sky libertarian who's more committed to his abstract principles than to saving, you know, creating a society his children can actually live in. How do you respond to something like that? I mean, it's obviously you don't want to become what, what you hate, but you have to understand that you're in a war. I and mean, this, is, this is a war for our minds. Too. I mean, look at all of this Russia Ukraine stuff. Half of my family is Ukrainian. I've never pronounced Kiev Kiev. And my great grandmother came here from Ukraine. I've never, I mean, the kind of social engineering that the left is able to do, I just don't see how, you know, taxation is theft, plastered everywhere, fights against it. I've said in the past that I didn't think that the Ron Paul movement did anything politically except for individuals. And I'm wrong because y'all, Young Americans for Liberty, is, you know, directly, I mean, they used to be called students for Ron Paul. Well, now they're basically destroyed and they've gone left. They've gone regime. You know, they don't want people criticizing Liz Cheney. And <laughs> when you look at 
most people who are clinging to the ideology, the ideology part of it, the principle part of it, to have a discussion with them about, um, so, you know, schools have been taken over, they're teaching critical race theory. What, what do you think should be done about that? And it's like, oh, well, just end schools. Everybody homeschools, end schools. I'm like, believe me, I'm, <laughs> I promote people to homeschool as well. But that's not the answer because your neighbor is not going to start homeschooling and that neighbor is sending their kid to a school to become a soldier for progressivism. And you're teaching them at home and if you're a libertarian, you're teaching them to have like no time preference for power. So your kid's going to grow up and is going to be interested in business, whatever. You know, libertarian is going forward with the ideology and which basically says political power, using political power to crush your enemies is immoral. Well, your neighbor is not learning that. So what is the answer? And that's the question I've been asking and I've been getting attacked. I don't care. I get, I got broad shoulders. Like, what is the answer? What is the libertarian answer to the fact that if you're homeschooling and one other person on your street is homeschooling and the rest of the street is not homeschooling and they're all becoming soldiers for progressivism? Okay, so you got some, you're raising some great kids who are going to be oppressed by those who, the rest of the block, who are going to grow up, seek political power, vote for like the total state. So what is the libertarian answer? And I can't sit here and tell you that I know exactly what it is. But to not explore and ask that question and look at the reality that if you're not willing to get political power and use political power or at least become a lobbyist or become somebody who financially is the money in the background pushing in the direction of crushing these people and like talking about liberty what do we look like 30 years from now? Are we still posting taxation as theft memes on Twitter and you know talking about homeschooling? Because I don't even know if we'll be able to do that by that point. And I'm not being hyperbolic. I mean, they're seizing people's bank accounts because they donated to a protest for a bunch of blue collar guys. How long before that come? I mean, we've had it here. Obama used that. I remember Obama taking payments away from like gun companies. And there was a gun company in Georgia when I was living there. They, they couldn't find a payment system. Well, I mean, what's the answer? How far are we willing to go? Maybe that's the answer. The question we need to ask is how far are we willing to go in politics, using politics and using power and still be able to sleep at night and maybe still, you know, we're, going to be in the pod eating bugs 30 years from now. Hey, everybody, let's take a quick minute to thank our unbelievably great sponsor, Persist SEO. It will help you out of a rut if your business is not going in the direction you want to see it go. So if you're getting buried by your competition online, you can build your brand, your reputation, and your lead flow with digital marketing by Persist SEO. Or if you're a small local business, you're trying to compete against large companies in the service industry, you can increase your visibility with Persist SEO. What if you're not getting any leads coming in on a consistent basis, or you can count them on one hand? Well, the website search engine and conversion optimization that Persist SEO offers can help move the needle to a more prosperous business model for you. And if you're tired of cold calling, and frankly, who isn't, you can use your website as a lead generation engine. And if you're not showing up for your services on the search engines, then get found with Persist SEO's expert search engine optimization. All you have to do is call 770-580-3736 or visit them at INeedSEO.help for a free website audit and consultation. That's INeedSEO.help. I still can see the arguments of both sides. I still can see the arguments of people who say, there's been a lot of political organizing by basically decent people for a very long time, and it has shockingly little to show for itself. Whereas we could at least carve out livable existences for ourselves if we had devoted some of those billions of dollars, instead of to fruitless political campaigns, to building up the infrastructure of life. For example, 
Well, you know, the Ron Paul homeschool curriculum is an example of the kind of thing that some of that money could have gone to. Never occurred to any of these people. How about we come up with a curriculum so that our kids don't have their brains destroyed? You know, I mean, how about we devote one half of 1% of the money we're about to blow on this Senate campaign to that project? I hear that, but I also hear people who say, all right, it's great if you don't want to be in politics. There are a lot of other things you can do, but the thing about politics is it's going to keep going whether or not you have your principled opposition to it. It's still there. And it may be that the major opposition party is really feckless and ineffective, but maybe it holds off the worst of the worst for a little while, or at least it gives you a little bit more livability so that you can go off and garden or do whatever it is you want to do. So I can hear both of these points of view. And this is partly why I don't think there's any moral problem with voting, even though it may be pointless in practice in some cases. There's no moral problem with it. Lysander Spooner didn't think there was any moral problem with it. Neither did Murray Rothbard. If it's good enough for Spooner and Rothbard, it's good enough for Woods. So I'm not against this stuff. And for some people, that is what their area of specialty is going to be. Honestly, it's, I guess I want to know if we're not involved in it in some way, I want you to describe for me what your alternative way for us to get to where we need to be is. And I never, Pete, I never get a really clear answer when I ask that question. What is your alternative? While people who can't stand the side of you are actively organizing to expropriate you and make your life miserable and push your face into the dirt and brainwash your kids, how is this going to work if we're not even part of that? How is that supposed to work? And I'm sorry, it can't just be Bitcoin solves this. That's just, come on now. I mean, let's be realistic people. What is the outcome whereby we somehow defeat them? Why? By all of us seceding individually and going off the grid? I don't want to go off the grid. The grid is civilization, okay? I have no desire to do that whatsoever. So I intend to stand and fight. And some of that fight is going to have to, it's going to have to be political, not because I want it to be, but because the enemies of mankind have arranged it that way. And those are the cards we've been dealt. I guess that's why, there's no question in there, Pete. That's just the way I'm thinking. Well, I mean, there is a question in there. You asked, what am I advocating? And honestly, I've read everything. You know, I've, the agorists, the agorists, I've, I've read um, Konkin extensively. And I think there's some great ideas in there. I just don't think that it's going to take down a state. And I don't think it's ever taken down a state. As a matter of fact, I have evidence that it's helped to grow states and there's a chance that Russia could have collapsed earlier if it wasn't for black markets. Then Bitcoin, yeah, I mean, God, yeah, I have no problem with Bitcoin. I just don't see it taking down a system because you're not going to get it adopted. By the time you have everyone adopting it, the system would have already had to have been replaced with something else that would be amenable to Bitcoin. Bitcoin's not going to do it. It would be a byproduct. Honestly, everything I've read, it's what Hans Hermann Hoppe, that speech he gave in January of 1997 in Long Beach for the, I think it was a Mises Supporters Summit and the What Must Be Done speech and local politics. I honestly believe that local politics is the only answer. And there is a problem with that too. I do not think that you know Hans's What Must Be Done at this point works in blue areas. So I grew up in the Bronx. It's not going to work in the Bronx. It's not going to work in Manhattan. It's not going to work anywhere near a big city. I think it's going to have to be explicitly red areas. And his whole idea of getting people elected locally, using the ideology to influence people to seek to privatize schools in the area, to privatize everything in the area, to take power away from the people who are not net taxpayers, the people who aren't paying taxes, the people who are making their living off of taxes, taking their vote away. And I have some ideas on other, I've talked about on my podcast extensively for the last six months about other things to do to build upon this and other programs that you know friends of mine have come up with. But honestly, I think local politics is the only answer right now. While, and I've talked to Tho Bishop about this, I know you had Tho on talking about the paleo strategy, and um, he and I have talked about that too, is while you're doing that and while you're securing your local area to fight against these lockdowns, you know, I've even talked about, you know, remember the 
the Boog Boys, the Boogaloo Boys from a couple years ago, you really don't hear about them anymore. I mean, well, that's just insanity. Standing up if they send in some kind of government force to, you know, say this town must be vaccinated or something. The people standing up against it are just going to be marginalized. I mean, you have to have the sheriff. You have to have the police force on your side, especially the sheriff. You know, I mean, I know that almost sounds old school, old school JBS, um, but it really... I was talking to Tom Luongo the other day, and he said the reason why we didn't get gun control in 2010, because they had a bill ready to go, was because sheriffs, and it was started by a sheriff in California, said, we are not going to enforce these laws. As a matter of fact, we're going to fight against them. So I think locally really is where the fight starts. And like I said, I've talked with Tho, and you know, Tho talks about the next step after that is getting people strategically put in place in like state houses and, you know, in the state governments, you know, real populist right kind of people. And then getting some of those people to run interference in DC too. But that's a longer, to me, that's a longer plan when you go statewide and national. But honestly, I think really at this point, people should go back and listen or read what must be done by, by Dr. Hoppe. And I know the Mises Institute Tho was handing them out at CPAC. The Mises Institute recently did like a booklet version of it. He was handing them out at CPAC along with Nations by Consent by Rothbard. And that's what he's trying to do. And honestly, you know, I'm, I'm on his team, but I'm really looking at locally. And look at what he's done locally in Bay County with the Bay County GOP in Florida. He's basically taken that over and he said he gives speeches and he'll just like crib Rothbard and People give him standing ovations, and all he's done is just basically been reading Rothbard to them. I mean, I, I think local politics is the way. I, I have a hard time arguing with Dr. Hoppe. Well, not to mention he scares me, and so I prefer, <laughs> prefer to avoid argue, arguing with him. But, no, of course, I love the guy, and I agree with you. I did a, a little live discussion of that what is to be done thing with Jeff Deist in, uh, I guess it was St. Petersburg yeah. in late 2021. And it was very thought provoking. It provokes very interesting discussion. So what do I want to say as we're wrapping this up? First of all, I also, I had a chance to speak in the fall of, now I don't even remember what year it was. Was it this year? The previous year? It's all blurring together. I think it was late 2020 where I spoke to a room full of about a hundred, yeah, it must've been, state legislators from around the country. So there might've been one or two from a particular state. But what I realized was that one or two state legislators who are actually informed and, you know, aren't just the track coach from down the street with nothing else to do, but who really are informed and, and know what they believe in and what they want, can actually accomplish a lot and, or, or they can obstruct a lot or they can be a rallying point to people or they can use their office to spread ideas. And these are offices that are not impossible to win. We don't necessarily have to immediately go for the U.S. Senate. These are not impossible offices to win. There are a lot of strategies you can use that can work very effectively to win those offices. And so you don't need 95% of the state house to be with you. You can still accomplish something even as you're trying to build with this approach. You can still enjoy some victories. Obviously, you have a website. Is that Can you get your Substack? I assume it's linked on your website? Yeah. Well, freemanbeyondthewall.com. I haven't change the name of that. I still actually like that name, but freemanbeyondthewall.com is where um, you can subscribe and join up and become a subscriber and get benefits depending on levels. And uh, my Substack is just pequenones.substack.com. It's called by any memes necessary. And there's, you can, you can, <laughs> you'll know you found it when you see the picture of Malcolm X, because, you know, obviously I stole that from Malcolm. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, so that's the way. I mean, I have a Patreon. The Monopoly on Violence is on Amazon Prime. It took us six months to get it on Amazon Prime. But um, you know, there's a good libertarian documentary actually on Amazon Prime that people out in... I've actually heard from people in the wild. Ryan McMakin told me he was, uh, I think he was at church and, and somebody said, yeah, I was watching some documentary on Amazon the other day. And then there, there's just you talking. Everything. So it's reaching normies too. So, um, yeah. Yeah. But, but the Pete Quinones show, I mean, that is um, 
that's what started it all for me. And that's where I uh, concentrate on really, you know, that, that's where probably 90% of my focus and energy goes into. Okay, excellent. Well, I'll link to that at tomwoods.com slash 2076. And uh, continued good luck to you, Pete. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Tom. I appreciate it. Okay, everybody, that's it for today. Tomorrow, we're going back in time. We're going to do a little bit of U.S. history, talking about the economic policy of Thomas Jefferson. We've got to take a breather from all the madness in the world and cover some stuff that we just should know about as educated people. But then on Friday, we're going to get a very, very thorough backgrounder on the situation between Russia and the West. And I know there are some of you out there who are skeptics and say, oh, the libertarians, they're always, quote, blaming America first, which is a phrase you just shouldn't use. Okay, that's a phrase you shouldn't use. I loved that speech too when Gene Kirkpatrick gave it at the Republican convention in 1984. As a 12-year-old kid, I watched that convention and I loved that speech. But man, that speech has made rational discussion impossible for a huge percentage of the population. First of all, conflating America, blame America first, and the regime. I'm part of America, but I have nothing to do with the formulation of policy. I'm not blaming myself. But secondly, it's simply to say history didn't start 10 minutes ago, and we have to have a non-cartoonish, we have to take a non-cartoonish look at the world. And yet there are a lot of bad guys, not just the U.S. regime, there are a lot of bad guys in the world. But when they're nuclear armed, you got to think to yourself, well, even if their stupid grievances seem stupid to me, and even if they act like buffoons, I'd rather not have the world burn down. And I'd rather have my kids not die in a fire or survive and have to cope with radiation. I have to put aside whatever visceral response I have and think like a rational person, not about what's the perfect outcome and that I won't be satisfied until I get the perfect outcome. It's what is a likely and reasonable outcome that can prevent the destruction of the world. That's what we're after here. It's not a matter of this one's right and this one's wrong. When the stakes are this high, it's a matter of what is the best realistic situation we can hope for and not destroy the world in the process of getting it. That's it. It's not the, oh, you sympathize with blah, blah. Stop. Okay, you know, I mean, I know my listeners aren't at that level, but there are a lot of people out there who, oh, you're a Putin sympathizer. Okay, if I want the world not to be destroyed and you're going to call me that name, I will accept you're calling me that name, but it's a dumb name. So anyway, that's coming up on Friday. So stay tuned to the Old Tom Woods Show. And if you like and appreciate what all Woods is doing here, then check out supportinglisteners.com. I have so many goodies that I give to people who support this show because I just can't get over the goodness, kindness, and generosity of my people that I'm just given so much back. You should go look there and you'll say, I can't believe just how thoughtful Woods is. I thought putting out five free episodes a week was pretty darn thoughtful, but this just takes the cake. So the website is supportinglisteners.com. I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.